Order members, order. We come to questions to the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister. And we will start with topical questions, which will last 15 minutes. And I call Ian Millen. In light of uh, Judge Tracy's judgment on Friday uh, that said, Mr. Spitz's decision to ban blood donations from gay men is irrational and in breach of the ministerial code, what steps will the First Minister, as the DUP nominating officer, uh, take to, uh, on this matter? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, unlike a lot of the people who have been commenting on this issue, I've actually read the, the judgment and read it several times. He, of course, does not say that a decision uh, to uh, ban MSM blood uh, is irrational. He indicated that uh, the uh, irrationality came from uh, banning it in Northern Ireland but allowing a small quantity to come in from outside of Northern Ireland. That, of course, could be rectified if the minister so chose. He had, however, two other grounds, uh, both of which uh, I, I think the executive is going to have to look at on the constitutionality issue as to whether uh, there was a power for the minister to take such a decision. I suspect, uh, no matter what the department may ultimately decide whether they appeal or not, I suspect the Department of Health in Great Britain may well uh, appeal the issue because there are devolution issues uh, at stake here uh, as to whether the uh, powers that are given to the member country can be devolved uh, to uh, the devolved regions, which was assumed to be the, the case. And that's an issue quite separate that has to be considered. The other issue, of course, uh, which is in breach of the ministerial code, uh, these provisions were provisions that uh, were put in during the negotiations by my party. Uh, they have been discussed on a number of occasions uh, at executive meetings, and we have taken advice from time to time from the Attorney General. There has been a general view on the part of the executive that if we were to carry them to the level that uh, Mr. Justice Tracy carried it to, that literally everything would come to the uh, executive. Uh, no spending decision, no individual decisions by minister could happen. They would all have to come to the executive uh, committee. And I think there are very major difficulties uh, in doing that. Uh, and I think the executive is going to have to, to look at that issue uh, as well. But it is very clear anyway that any significant major decision that is taken that is controversial should come to the executive committee. But no member of the executive committee asked this to, for this to be discussed. Ian Miller, supplementary. Very good, uh, Ken Collier. And uh, I'd like to thank the minister for his answer uh, thus far. But uh, does the minister accept Judge uh, Tracy's and agree with Judge Tracy's uh, ruling on this matter? Good. You're trying to get me into to trouble. Uh, I, I think that those are obviously matters that can be uh, considered by uh, those from a legal background. Uh, if the department does not agree with it, then it can appeal that uh, judgment. In terms of the ministerial code, uh, I had been more uh, content and felt that uh, the Lord Chief Justice's ruling on that matter was a, a sensible uh, judgment in that he indicated that if there was a controversial or significant matter, then it would be raised at the executive committee. That meant that only, if you like, the nuclear issues would start coming to the executive rather than every single issue. Because if every single issue is brought to the, the executive, then there is no minister in this House will be able to take any decision on their own. They're all going to have to come through the executive committee. So before people start cheering to the, the rafters about this issue, they should think of the ramifications of the judgment. Uh, Joe Byrne. Mr. Byrne. Mr. Speaker, would the First Minister agree that the ongoing protest camp at Tredell Avenue is causing major concern in that neighbourhood? And what would the First Minister and indeed the Deputy First Minister jointly hope to do to try and resolve that situation for those neighbourhood people there? Well, of course, there, there is disruption, I have, I have no doubt, to people uh, in the, the neighbourhood, and I have no doubt that uh, it uh, puts a, additional uh, pressure on the PSNI of the additional work that they have to do. Uh, but we do defend uh, in this country people's right to peacefully and lawfully uh, protest. And as long as protests are carried out peacefully and lawfully, then uh, those of us who are part of a democratic institution uh, should be uh, content uh, to, to support their, their right. Uh, in terms of what we are doing about it, uh, the Deputy First Minister and I uh, brought in colleagues from the, the leaders of other parties. 
We recognise that there were some outstanding issues in relation to parades and flags in the past that needed to be resolved. Uh, we therefore came to, together and they agreed that uh, Dr Richard Haas uh, should facilitate and chair uh, an all-party group that would look at those outstanding issues. And uh, those are the very issues that uh, are at the heart of the protest campaign at uh, Twadell. Uh, I urge everybody uh, to remember that uh, they have to uphold the rule of the law. Uh, they have to cooperate with the PSNI and they have to uh, abide uh, by the, the conditions that are laid down. Uh, but I, I do protect people's right uh, to, to protest, providing they do it lawfully and peacefully. Yeah. Uh, Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the First Minister for his answer. Would the First Minister agree, however, that given that the Hacks Talks process has started, that the business community in Belfast are very concerned that there might be more protest parades in the city coming up to the festive season? And what words of encouragement could he give to people to make sure that protests do not end in disruption and cause havoc to the shopping community? Well, I, I would sympathise particularly with the traders in Belfast who had uh, a very bad uh, period around Christmas of, of last year. Uh, and when we talk about uh, rights, there are, of course, competing rights. There's the right of people to carry out their, their daily business, whether that's in businesses or whether it's going in to uh, carry out commercial activity in the centre of, of Belfast. Uh, and people carrying out uh, activities in terms of protests have to take into account uh, the, the rights of others and uh, of the, the wider society. Uh, I have heard of some proposals to, to hold protests leading up to the Christmas period. I hope people will reflect on the damage that that would cause to Northern Ireland and to the traders in Belfast, potentially leading to a loss of, of jobs. Uh, the, the protest in Twadell Avenue will not have that uh, impact, but certainly if uh, protests were brought into the centre of Belfast, it has that uh, possible outcome. George Robinson. Mr. Thank Robinson. you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, could I ask the First, first Minister to give a, the House an update on the highly successful investment conference, conference held last week? In Belfast. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I think the, the, the member has probably used the, the two words that uh, do sum it up, which is highly successful. Uh, of course, the ultimate success uh, is in outcomes. It's uh, in actually being able to tie down the, the, the jobs that would come to Northern Ireland and the level of investment that would come. Uh, both the, the Deputy First Minister and I have uh, been involved now in three investment conferences back in 2008, then the Washington Investment Conference, uh, kindly organized uh, by the United States Administration under uh, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, and then this one. Uh, and we are both agreed that uh, in terms of the contact that we have had with uh, investors, this is by far the most successful conference that, that we have had. Uh, the response was very positive from those that we spoke to, uh, both on the, the evening, the Friday evening or the Thursday evening in uh, Hillsborough Castle uh, at the, the dinner. Uh, and some people, I, I noticed the BBC talking about whining and dining and so forth. I have to say that it is that kind of networking that really does get you a connection with business people. It is the opportunity for you to find out what projects various companies are looking at and therefore how we might fit into to, uh, their needs uh, uh, and requirements. Uh, and again, at that uh, dinner, we spoke to a number of people, both the Deputy First Minister at his table uh, and me at mine, uh, spoke to people who were looking at Northern Ireland as a possible place for investment. And the encouraging thing the next day was to find that a lot of those companies who had Northern Ireland on a short list were indicating that Northern Ireland had now leapfrogged yeah. to the top of their short list. Uh, and that indicates how successful uh, the investment conference was. The Deputy First Minister and I went down to uh, invest Northern Ireland's offices this morning to thank the, the team who had worked so hard. Uh, and we give uh, due recognition to Alistair Hamilton and his team uh, for the preparation and for the work that they carried out. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Robinson. Could I thank uh, the First Minister for his answer? And uh, could I ask the Minister, during the course of the Prime Minister's visit, did the First Minister have an opportunity to raise the issue of much-needed DVA jobs in Korean? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, yes, I, I, can, I gave a, an assurance when I was down uh, in Korean and met with the, the workers that I would raise it with the Prime Minister. And both the Deputy First Minister and I spoke to the Prime Minister about this uh, in the private meeting that we had with him. 
We presented him with an aid memoir, uh, which gave background details of the case, uh, and he has indicated that while there's presently uh, a consultation on, uh, he cannot obviously give any uh, definitive remarks, but will uh, make contact with us uh, closer to the time when a decision is being taken. Can I ask the First Minister what measures has OFM DFM in place to ensure the appropriate level of cooperation between the Victims and Survivors Service and the Victims Commissioner to ensure full compliance with all statutory requirements? <coughs> Well, I'm grateful for, for that question because I, I have noted, as no doubt uh, the, the member has, that there have been some remarks made more recently uh, on that subject. Uh, we have arranged within the department to, to bring together uh, the Victims Service and the Victims Commissioner with some of our own people, and we'll talk over those uh, issues, uh, and hopefully we will get them resolved. So action is already underway. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? Um, can I ask, is, is the Department and Minister satisfied that the needs of victims and survivors will be acknowledged and addressed as a result of the measures adopted by the Department? Well, th these are the kind of issues that must always be constantly under review. Uh, none of us should be complacent on these uh, matters. If there are specific uh, issues that the Victims Commissioner uh, wants to raise, and I understand she, she made some comments during a, a committee hearing, uh, we will want to hear what it is that the Commissioner feels that the service has fallen short in, uh, and we'll be happy to, to talk with the, the service about how those needs can be met if there is some shortcoming. We are in no way complacent. We don't uh, believe that we have yet reached the level of perfection which would allow us to sit back. So uh, constructive criticism uh, is something that none of us should run uh, away from. So let's see what the issues are and let's see how we might resolve them. Mervyn Storey. Mr Storey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Following on from the First Minister's comments at the opening of topical questions, could, could you return to the issue and indicate to the House what implications he believes the Tracy judgment has on the executive business? Well, I, I noticed that one comment uh, that was made was that on the, the foot of uh, Mr Justice Tracy's judgment, everything that's in the entry of any departmental minister will have to be transferred to the departmental entry of the Deputy First Minister and myself. Uh, that's not a position that I think we want to find ourselves in. We have to obviously work out where the, the, the bottom line is in terms of what it is important for the executive to, to deal with. The, uh, any other executive will deal with major issues. Uh, on the, the basis of Mr Justice Tracy's judgment, uh, we would have to be dealing with every funding uh, application, the division that uh, the education minister or the roads minister or the housing minister might make in terms of where they are going to have schools, hospitals, houses, roads, etc. Uh, and those are issues that we have left at a departmental level. Uh, and of course, even lower level issues would have to be decided uh, by the executive committee. So it would be a very considerable burden on the executive if we were to go down that uh, particular uh, route. Of course, we always knew, and the, the law is very clear on it, that uh, decisions which are controversial, decisions which are significant, decisions which are cross-cutting should come to the uh, executive. But we, uh, I thought we had uh, an understanding that uh, in those terms, if there was something that any of the executive members believed that fell within those categories, they should ask for those matters to be brought to the executive. And of course, it isn't just the executive will have a role in these circumstances. Not only do we now find that the, the general public through the courts would have a role, but of course this assembly has a role as well, because any 30 members can require an issue which they believe to be controversial, significant or cross-cutting to come to the executive as well. Story. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank the First Minister for his reply. Just to tease that out a little bit further, is the First Minister then giving an indication that there are implications uh, following on from the Tracy judgment, specifically in relation to issues of concern in education, which are very rife in the community this minute in time, specifically around the future of the Dixon plan and also in regards to the common fund and formula? Well, Mr Speaker, I don't believe that uh, the, the Tracy judgment uh, has any additional impact on those particular issues because I think that was something that was already uh, required under the previous judgments. And there's been several uh, judgments that have been given in and around the, the issue of the ministerial code and the requirement to bring 
material to the, the executive. Uh, the, the Tracy judgment goes, I think, beyond anything that we have had to, to date. That is uh, why I think the executive has to, to look at the issue. But clearly, whether it is a common funding uh, formula or whether it is uh, the Dixon plan, those are issues that uh, are controversial. There is no doubt about their controversy. They are also cross-cutting uh, and therefore would have to come to the executive anyway. Order, members. Order. That ends the